Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Hello, I'm Samantha Sonner. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Your Legislators. Today, I am joined in Santa Fe by Bill McCamley, the Democratic representative for District 33. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing fine, Samantha. How are you? Good. So we are about halfway through the budget, and there are two issues that people are really concerned with this session, and the first of that is the budget. So how are budget negotiations going up in Santa Fe right now? Well, it's kind of interesting because when you're talking about the budget, it's usually one of the most partisan things that is discussed, and it's full of all sorts of emotion and people really want to fund this or fund that. The problem this year is that there is absolutely no money. And when I say that, that is the actual description of what's going on. Um, we originally thought that we were going to have uh, a whole lot of new money from the gross receipts tax that eventually uh, didn't come to play. And one of the problems we have in New Mexico is that we are very reliant on oil and gas for the state's revenue. And that comes in two ways. Number one, we get direct taxes when barrels of oil and gas are sold on the market. And for every dollar that changes in the price per barrel of oil, we get or lose $9.5 million. So when the price of oil was 80 or or $100 a barrel, and now it's about 31 this morning, y'all have to do the math, and we obviously lose a bunch of money. But furthermore, we actually, uh, when, when folks are working in the oil and gas industry, they pay taxes. They pay income taxes. They pay gross receipts taxes when they buy things. And so when the price of oil goes down, it really hurts the ability for the state um, <clears throat> to fund the things that we fund. So the schools, the cops, the roads, all that sort of thing. And to be honest with you, it really highlights the fact that we've got to do a much better job of diversifying our economy. You know, for so long, New Mexico's relied on two things for our, um, our state revenues, and that's the federal government and the jobs that are provided at the military bases and the labs and all those other places, and the oil and gas industry. And so we've got to do a much better job in the future of trying to diversify our economic base so that we're not just relying on them, because uh, when oil prices drop, we drop, and it's like, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the movie or read the book Friday Night Lights, but it's about Odessa, Texas, and they talk about the oil booms and busts, and we're kind of a bigger version of that. Right, and this is something where we do have less money, but does that almost make budget negotiations easier because you're not fighting <laughs> over those new programs to fund? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, sometimes there's, and, and there will be some uh, discussions and some fairly emotional testimony tomorrow when we talk about the budget on the House floor about things like cutting universities and, and where the little bit of money we have goes in terms of the schools. Uh, one of the problems that a lot of the Democrats have, for instance, is that you're actually seeing a 5% increase in the Department of Corrections budget and only about a 1% increase in the schools. And we think, for instance, that is, that is backwards. If you really want to cut crime, if you really want to develop the economy in the future, funding education is the real concrete way to do that. Um, that being said, it, it does make things a little less partisan because when there's not much to fight over, there's not much to fight over. Right now, you mentioned those crime bills. That is one of the governor's big initiatives that she talked about in the State of the State Address. Is that not something that you agree with, those new programs? You know, I, th I think the issue this year is that in Albuquerque, there's been a lot of high profile crime uh, that's happened in the past year, and it's gotten a lot of media attention. It's funny, down in, in Las Cruces in southern New Mexico, we haven't had as big of an issue. And so a lot of uh, people in Las Cruces may wonder why we're focusing on all these uh, new 
uh, initiatives to put more people in prison. And I think that's partly the reason. There's some political reasons for that because of the issues in Albuquerque. I think the, the other problem is the governor's uh, an ex-district attorney, right? I mean, this is what she knows. It's what she cares about. It's what she can speak about intelligently. My problem with this entire discussion is that we are not focusing on the things that will make the state better holistically. So, for instance, when you talk about crime, wage rates are one of the biggest factors in determining how much violent and property crime there is. So when wages go up, crime, especially the violent and property crime levels, go down. So putting people in prison doesn't really help, but raising wages does. Yet we're almost halfway through the session, and I'm on the House side where the Republicans control the agenda, and the governor has a lot of influence. We have not heard one jobs bill, not one jobs bill, this entire year, and that's very, very frustrating. The other issues are if you raise uh, education funding and do a better job there, you're going to have less crime down the road in the future. Um, income inequality is a huge issue here in the state. New Mexico has the biggest difference between the middle class and very, very wealthy in the country. We have the highest rates of wealth inequality in the country. And as I said previously, when wages are low, crime goes up. So, you know, I have a bill, for instance, that will cut um, the state's capital gains breaks. So when people make money off the stock market, they have a lot of tax breaks and they actually pay less taxes than most working people. And I will get rid of that and move the tax um, help to people that are kind of at the lower edge of the working demographic. It's called the Earned Income Tax Credit. And it's one of the most successful uh, backed by data uh, policies that the government's ever done to raise people off of welfare, get people out of poverty, and since single mothers are the demographic that it helps the most, it's actually really good for kids. We'll be hearing that today in committee. It'll probably get voted down on a party line vote, and that's my frustration. Why aren't we working on creating more jobs, raising wages, doing a better job with education? and working on those things that will improve all of us holistically and systematically to make a better state. And I think there's a lot of political reasons the crime stuff is coming up, but I don't think it's gonna really work that well. You see a whole lot of states that tried this put more people in prison approach back in the 90s, and they're pulling away from that now because it didn't work. In fact, in Alabama, just this last year, Republicans, Republican governor, Republican House members, Republican Senate members passed a huge uh, criminal justice reform package because you can't prosecute your way uh, out of poverty. You can't build your way out of a criminal justice issue. And those are the things that, that we're trying to have the discussion about here in Santa Fe. Right, and you have a couple other economic development bills, and the first I one do. is the economic development reporting. And I found this one interesting could you talk about that one for a little bit? I'd love to. So the way economic development works, job creation works, it's real simple. You want to bring money from outside of your community into your community. If all you're doing is recycling money in your community, there's no new jobs created, right? So what are the things that we do well as a state? Uh, one of the things we have is some great research universities. We've got New Mexico State, and they've got the Arrowhead Research Park. You've got the Science and Technology Park at UNM. Uh, New Mexico Tech actually has some very good programs. So what are we doing to utilize the research that's being done at these universities to bring businesses to the universities and create new businesses uh, with the technology that is being invented. And so right now you've got these parks, but there's not a really a way to measure how successful they are. And at New Mexico State, for instance, if you go over to Arrowhead Park, there's not much going on. Um, they've done a couple of good things. They've got a building over there where General Dynamics is, and they have one really good program. I, I don't know how many of your viewers and listeners are aware of this, but we have a great shrimp processing facility in Doña Ana County that was developed from research done in the Ag Department. So the question is how we do more of that, and it's up to us as a legislature to make sure that the places that we're funding are held accountable. Right now, though, job creation is actually not part of the performance matrices 
for either UNM, NMSU, or New Mexico Tech when they have these economic development programs. So what I want to do is make job creation and money invested in the community part of their evaluation package so we know whether they're working or not. And what that does is it creates pressure on people there to think out of the box. What are we doing to create jobs? Have we done everything we can to work with the researchers at the university? What more can we do to get students involved? Can we bring more businesses in? And they are starting to do that, uh, especially at NMSU, and I'm very proud of them, but we need to do more. And I think that is the frustration that all of us have. We're tired of being last in the country in all of these bad economic indicators. All of us need to step up to the table and figure out new ways of creating a better economic opportunity. Because I'll tell you what, Samantha, here's the problem. We're spending, and we just talked about the budget, right? We're spending all this money on our schools and our universities. And what happens? These kids that we're educating, these students that we're investing in, are going to Dallas and Denver and Phoenix to get their jobs. So we're spending our state tax money creating the workforces for these other places. And that's a bad public policy. So as we invest in education, we've got to do a much better job of creating more economic opportunity so that people can stay here and everyone can benefit. Yeah, that was interesting for me to hear because I had just assumed that there was a system for reporting. And I think a lot of people just assume that, that these places that do get that economic development money do you have to report how many jobs that they do create? Yeah, and that's not the case, and that's what we're trying to fix. And once again, the, the focus here is to put pressure on everybody. And I need to take some of the blame, too. All of us need to take responsibility for the situation that we're in and create more of an air of urgency. You know, I've lived in Las Cruces since 1992. I went to high school and college there. I've had so many friends that either, you know, leave to another state because they want to experience the big city and whatnot and, and, and want to come back, or they want to stay, and they can't do it. You know, I went to NMSU. I went and got a degree from Harvard. I came back to Las Cruces, couldn't get a job, and ended up picking cotton for a while. And look, I love my town and I want to stay there, but that's just not going to work for a lot of people. So we've got to do a much better job of creating jobs that are going to pay a decent wage so that people can live here and do well. That's, that's the long and short of it. Now, another bill that you have that is economic development related is extending the hours at the Santa Teresa border station. So could you tell me yeah. a little bit about that? Well, once again, we got to find the things that we do as a state well and build on them. And one of the success stories we've actually had, hang on, I'm going to fix my earpiece. Sorry, I know that's a little awkward. One of the things that we do well as a state is the border trade uh, area. And if you go down to Santa Teresa, the, the business park down there is full up. They have uh, a lot of business in the manufacturing and the transport sectors. They have a lot of job openings all the time. It's working, and there's a lot of trade going on between the manufacturing facilities right across the border in Mexico, in Juarez, and in Ciudad Chihuahua. In fact, I actually w had the wonderful opportunity to travel to Ciudad Chihuahua in October to talk with their government and to talk with a lot of their business folks about how we do a better job of expanding the trade economy. And one of the things that we found was that we need to do a better job at the border. And there's two specific things we got to do. The first is expand the hours. When you've got shifts at manufacturing plants that last all night, you're basically transporting at all hours of the day. And so we've got to do a good job of opening that port uh, for a longer time. Right now it closes at 8. The ones in Texas are open till 12. And so some of the folks down there are deciding that they want to go down to Texas um, and use that port of entry rather than keep the one here in New Mexico going. So if we extend those hours, we're going to be a lot more competitive. The traffic situation is much better on our side of the border. So that will be an opportunity. The other thing we've got to try to do, and I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. in the first week of March to talk with our congressional delegation about this, is see if we can get some commercial lanes established going north and south so that as that traffic increases, we can keep that flow of trade going. And that's just going to encourage more trade through our port and more business creation at Santa Teresa, allowing for more jobs to be created and for our folks to do a better job, well, to have more opportunity to get good jobs. 
Right now, we actually recently reported that Dell is paying to keep that border station yeah. down in Santa Teresa open later. Is that something, especially when our budget is so tight, that we should be looking for more public-private partnerships like that? Well, I think what Dale's doing is they're keeping that border open going southbound because they're getting some of the parts they need from the United States for their facility just south of the U.S.-Mexico border. If we can match them and keep it open going northbound as well, we're going to be creating much, a much more open opportunity for a lot of these businesses to trade back and forth. And yes, I, I definitely think that's something we should be looking at. Okay, great. Uh, one of the other contentious issues that people are really following from up in Santa Fe is obviously the Real ID Act. So where right. is that out right now, halfway through the session? So the Real ID Act, uh, the, I, you know, I, I did a Facebook video of this where I tried to condense it down, but it still took about five minutes. So let me try to even explain it in an even shorter time. So the two proposals out there uh, for Real ID, and let's, let's be real honest what we're talking about here, the federal government has asked that a new type of license be issued with a lot more stringent security requirements for it to be used at federal facilities. So right now that means White Sands Missile Range, Fort Bliss, some of the other military bases. And in a couple years, that's gonna mean getting on airplanes and going through federal security checkpoints. Here in New Mexico, our governor has wanted to stop the process of giving driver's licenses to undocumented uh, immigrants for a long time. And it's very interesting to note that here in New Mexico, those two issues have been combined. No other state has done this. We're, we're the only state where these issues are coming together and kind of creating conflict. So the two uh, solutions that were being proposed are on the House side, that everyone would have to get a new Real ID compliant license and undocumented immigrants would therefore get a, what is called a driver's privilege card. Over on the Senate side, what was the proposal was um, everyone can keep their license now if they want to, including undocumented immigrants, but if a, new, if a person wants a real ID compliant card, they choose to go back to the DMV, they show their birth certificate or their passport or whatever, and they get a new ID with a little marker on the bottom right saying it's real ID compliant. What happened a couple of days ago is that the House version, this is the driver's privilege card version, went over to the Senate, and the Senate changed some of the provisions. Uh, specifically, they took out some of the security provisions for the driver's privilege card. And the reason for that is simple. Look, if I'm an undocumented person and I have to go give my fingerprints to be able to get a card, I'm probably not going to do it. Now, we want these people to have a license or at least a card because it allows them to go through the test and get insurance. That's why we did the program in the first place. It makes our roads safer, period. And if we create such a huge barrier to that, that they're not gonna bother, it, we might as well not do it at all. And so the Senate removed that out and the governor basically wants to put that back in. And that's the sticking point right now. You know, the other thing too is, it allows for people who are uncomfortable going to the DMV and showing a lot of information to keep a driver's privilege card as well. That's one of the things that gets left out of the conversation here a lot is there's a lot of people that are very, very unwilling to give the federal government their fingerprints or other identifying information. And if we make them do that, some of them might choose not to get a driver's license and drive without a license as well. So there's a lot of issues coming together. I will say the process is being negotiated. I think it's moving forward. Um, obviously, we all want to get this done. This is a huge issue for a lot of the people, especially in our area, where many folks actually go onto military bases for work a lot. So we all want to get it done, but we also want to make sure we do it right. The process is proceeding. I think we're going to come up with something, I hope we come up with something, that everyone in the legislature can kind of get behind. And if that happens, it'll be up to the governor to make a decision on whether to sign it or not. Okay, and so from what I am hear you saying, you agree more with the proposal that's in the Senate right now. I, I do. I think that we need to have a, a provision that will allow people to get these, these either privilege cards or licenses without a stigma or without a barrier to get them. I also, let's be real simple here, if we force everyone to go get a Real ID compliant card at the same time, the bureaucratic mess that's going to happen at the DMV is going to be huge. And so how do we come up with a new policy that allows for people, even if they're here illegally, to continue driving, that also complies with Real ID, 
that everyone at the legislature and the governor can kind of at least put their names on, and that is the conflict right now. Right, and we have a couple minutes left here, and I know that you have another bill that's in that isn't really budget related, which is a little strange for the 30 day session. And that has to do with concussions on high school athletes. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, well, I played a lot of soccer and hockey when I was a kid and I got knocked out a lot, but I was a tough guy. I always wanted to get back in there and I went back in and played. I remember one time I played the whole second half of a hockey game after being knocked out for about five or six seconds and was woozy. And at the end I was like, yeah, still won. Unfortunately, that happened before a lot of the research on concussions, especially with the National Football League, were coming out. And what we're seeing is that if you get a head injury and you get another one before the initial injury has time to heal, the possibilities for long-term um, mental issues and physical issues are very, very high. And so about five years ago, six years ago, there was a bill passed that said if you're in school, and you get diagnosed with a concussion in whatever sport you're playing, football, soccer, hockey, cheerleading, whatever, you've got to sit out for seven days. This past year, a student at Cleveland High School in Albuquerque found, was diagnosed with a concussion, wanted to go play in the next game, which happened to be the state championship game, right? And found a doctor and a lawyer that was willing to go to a judge to get an injunction to stop the law for a little while and allow them to play in the next game. And I find that very, very dangerous, um, especially at the youth level. When these head injuries occur, they must be given time to heal. And so I've created a bill that will hopefully close that loophole by saying to someone, if you want to appeal the decision of an athletic trainer for a concussion, you have to go to the Mexico Athletic Association first. Now, it hasn't gotten a message from the governor. Um, and so in a 30-day session where you're restricted to talking about budget issues or constitutional amendments, without permission from the governor, it can't be considered. And so that, that's very disappointing for me. I was hoping to you know, have a chance to bring this up for discussion, but I'm also glad it, it's gotten some publicity. And so I'm hoping that if, even without the bill, if parents and students and coaches and judges understand what the real dangers are here, they won't allow the temptation of playing in the next game to override common sense. Okay, and now another thing that was a big issue last year was capital outlay, and it didn't get mm -hmm. passed in the 60-day session. Where are we looking at that in the 30-day session right now? Well, we haven't heard of capital outlay being as contentious and political as an issue this year as it was last year. In fact, we're, we're meeting this morning amongst our delegation in Dona Ana County to kind of see where we can put our money together to, to go uh, to do the most good. The issue with capital outlay, though, is this. A lot of the money gets, gets um, allocated in a piecemeal manner. And so our challenge is to find money, uh, put it together into projects that can get done right away. Obviously, like we said before, our economy is in bad shape right now. We need to do the best job possible creating the most jobs right away and improving our infrastructure right away. And what that means is all of us have to work together to find projects that are shovel ready that we can comp complete very soon. And that's going to be our challenge going forward this year. Okay, great, and I want to just talk about one more thing quick, and I know it's not a quick issue, but that would be water, and you have a couple bills. <laughs> <laughs> you have a couple bills on the water issues this session. Yeah, the old Western saying is, uh, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over. And it's a very contentious issue. And here's the problem. This year, we've had a lot of rain. And a lot of folks don't remember the last five years when we were in a very low water situation. And I don't like to use the word drought, because a lot of people say drought, and they think this is going to be temporary. If you look, though, at tree ring data and climate uh, studies for the past 100 years, you see that rainfall and snowfall is cyclical. And when you then add the probable effects of climate change to that, there's a possibility that we might have a long-term future in the state without a lot of rainfall. And you only need to go look at California 
and the failure that they had and the very, very harsh measures they had to put in uh, with that very, very recent drought over there to see what not to do. So we've really got to do a better job looking forward with our water policy. How do we become more efficient? How do farmers have the ability to transfer water on a much more um, productive and easy level? How do we make sure that we look at things like water storage and desalinization to increase our water resources in times when we don't have a lot of water? These are all discussion areas we've got to be very, very focused on, because when we don't have water, we don't have life in the state. We do live in a desert. Right, and you have two bills focused on that, one yeah. looking at efficient water use and studying that? Yeah, I'll actually be, as soon as I'm off the camera here, I'm going up to a committee to talk about that. And how do we work with the cities around the state to do a better job at the residential and commercial level of being efficient? Now, I will say, Las Cruces, Rio Rancho, Santa Fe, and Albuquerque, the four biggest cities in the state, have done a very, very good job of being more efficient with their water use. In fact, if you look at Albuquerque, they're using the same amount of water now that they used in 1980, even though there's a lot more people. Santa Fe actually uses a lot uh, less water. Uh, and down in Las Cruces, we use more. Uh, a lot of people still with swamp coolers, and it's hotter down there. But the cities are doing a good job. How do we continue that trend? And also, how do we use the techniques that were developed at the big cities at the smaller cities and the smaller mutual domestic level to make sure that they're as efficient as possible. And then, once again, everyone's got to have skin in the game for water. So once the cities are doing everything they can, how do we do the same thing with agriculture? And how do we do the same thing at the oil and gas industry? And when all three of those groups come together to use water efficiently and intelligently, then we got a shot at moving forward well with our water situation. Okay, great. So we are going to wrap it up here, but how can people get in touch with you if they have any more questions about stuff you talked about here today? Sure. Well, my cell phone number is 575-496-5731. Anyone can feel to call me at any time. My email is Bill dot mccamley at nmlegis.gov and that goes right to my gmail account so i do get all those emails i do a facebook update pretty much every day it's a short three to five minute video about what happened for the day and there's obviously discussion things that happen there on facebook and i've tried to be better at twitter this year and it's just at bill mccamley and so you can contact me there as well okay great thank you very much for joining us bill mccamley and thank you very much for listening to your legislators